Good evening. So, as promised, I have a, a very, very boomer energy video for you today. So, th this started, I was trying to think about sort of what, what cards historically have been kind of the most influential design-wise, right? Not just cards that are like, oh, this is too powerful, don't do that exactly again, but stuff that really, you know, warped design or changed the way tuning was done or just kind of caused a trend or something like that. And as I was making that list, I was starting to mix in some things that were like, well, you know, here's the first time EX appeared and what and whatnot or, or things like that. And so I, I went up sort of mixing them um, th and making a list of things that are either sort of the first time something interesting showed up or stuff that was pretty impactful. And, and I kind of sorted them more or less by date and figured we'd just kind of walk through and, and talk about stuff. Um, just, just kind of a bit of a history walk, just touching on, you know, not every crazy card that's ever been printed or anything like that, but just st stuff that was a first or stuff that really sort of had a lasting impact in, in some form or another. So, you know, I'm not sure how long this is going to take. I have like a few dozen slides to go through here, but I'm just going to kind of ramble about cards. And I wasn't the most super active in the first few years. I've asked a couple people some questions, but I might have some fine details wrong. Someone will correct me in the comments. But, you know, we're just going to run through, you know, the pre-MHA. Here's this picture on the first slide is of Lu Chen, who is a character from the Shadow War IP, which is not an IP you will see uh, much of anywhere else. It is something that one of the people at uh, Games Workshop slash Fantasy Flight came up with to use as an original IP. If you've, if you've heard of Red Horizon, it, it was sort of the first one of those, but before Jasco. And I have Luchin here because he's old and this is a massive boomer energy thing. So we're gonna, the, the webcam's gonna get in the way. So we're gonna close that out here. And yeah, so let's get started. So first things first, for people who don't know, and I'm, I'm kind of going to assume, you know, this is targeted at people who really only know MHA. The very first UFS set, because it used to be called UFS and not Universes, I'm sure you've heard people just say UFS. The, the first release was a Penny Arcade Battle Box. It was Tycho versus Gabe in this sort of little bottle box that they released, at, I believe, at a PAX. And that, that was the launch of the game. And... We might do this a lot with some of these early cards. We can take a moment to appreciate how completely not balanced these are against each other. You know, so obviously this came out. These characters were supposed to be played against each other. This was supposed to be a fair match, but this is a brand new game, a brand new system. Nothing really, no similar card game had ever been made. There was nothing really to reference. Games Workshop, who owns Sabretooth Games, was not really a card game company. So they didn't exactly know what they were doing when they started this. So Gabe here, if you're on audio only, he can commit a foundation to give a chaos attack one damage, plus one damage, and he can commit and pay a momentum to take an attack that dealt damage and put it in his momentum immediately. So he gets a, a weird pseudo-free on-hit pool clear if he has momentum and he's a six-hander. There's been worse characters, but this is obviously not that great. Tycho is a 723 that commits a foundation after he plays a form card or ability to draw a card. Which is silly, of course. And then he just has enhanced commit. This attack is blocked. Just no, just it's blocked. So that that was kind of what we were dealing with with power levels early on. And we're not going to go go through like all the cards here, but there were most attacks were two checks uh, was another thing that was happening. Uh, that, that eventually changed. There was no like single card that signaled the change of that trend but you know over time the you know the developers figured out that you know yeah people just aren't really playing more than a handful of two checks in their decks and then they they eventually caved and started making things mostly three but that was very gradual over time early on the large majority of attacks were two checks so that that was how it got started it was actually penny arcade uh, before we got into the street fighter and soul caliber sets and what do we have next? I actually don't remember what order all of these are in, so I'm going to be a little surprised at some of these. So next we're going to talk about Mystic. So Mystic was a first set card that said form commit, go pick up something from your removed from game pile. And originally, 
your mulligan was to remove your hand from the game. But both players could remove their hand from the game and draw back that many cards, so obviously this card, if you mulligan, had a lot of choices, and just in general, uh, it was it was a problem, right? Uh, very early on, you know, people were doing all sorts of, you know, there were decks that had strategies that used their remove from game pile as a place to tutor stuff from, and, and this is really very early on sort of the reason why we, we've ended up in this place. The remove from game pile is kind of sacred. We don't really pull stuff from it unless it's looking for a specific card, like a copy of something or whatever, and even then it's very rare. And, and really, Mystic was a, a very, very early early thing that set that bar. Uh, there were like a few more cards that fetched from the remove from game pile. After that, they were higher costed. But really, after Mystic, uh, you know, the the, the team learned pretty early on that, that this is just not something that you do. <laughs> that, that was a very early, quickly impactful card. What's next on this? Oh, Matt Coles! So this is the first champ card. So as you probably heard around the standard sunset time, the prize for winning a Nationals or a Worlds level event was to get a champ card made of yourself as a tournament legal character in the game. And so this is the very first world champion, Matt Coles, from... UFS House, if you've heard some old people talk about them with some reverence. That was a playgroup from, I believe, Ohio that was very, very good and won a lot of things. And yes, yeah, so there's not too much to say about this. This is the first champ card. 2006 World Champion. He won with a, a promo Tira deck that I probably shouldn't get too many into too many details of, but we will talk about Matt Coles a little bit more in a little bit here. Uh, so I will just point out that he has this ability, form, discard a non-block, go pick up a block. It's going to be relevant in a little bit here. Right now? Yeah, yeah, right here. We have a segue. So Matt Coles was one of the first... So early on, there were actually a lot of loops in the early years of the game. Right, Infinites or pseudo-infinites were not everywhere, but there, it, it seemed like there were always like a couple of, a, a couple of these running around that people were trying to play, and one of them was Yori's Fireball with Matt Coles, which, if you got two of these things, you could basically play it for as many cards as you could find to discard to it. Right, so you played some card draw and you just kept going Fireball, 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 Fireball. And then there was there were other loops around this Reverse Waterfall card, where as long as you could keep writing Foundations or keep finding ways to commit Foundations, and I believe the aforementioned Tira shared with this, I, I might be mistaken, but there were there were some characters that did it, and Matt Coles actually got in a rata at one point to try to, uh, you know, cut down on the Yori's Fireball stuff. I actually don't know if the, the picture that I had might be the errata version, even. My memory is not quite that good. But Reverse Waterfall, I believe, actually never got banned. Right? Nothing ever happened to Reverse Waterfall, even though Reverse Waterfall endless loop decks were kind of always just around. But it was just never quite good enough. But this was a, a frequent thing pretty early on. There were there were always, you know, one to three decks in the format that were doing some kind of loop or lock uh, throughout the fantasy, the Sabretooth and Fantasy Flight days. Next we have a couple cards. So we have the Watch here and Sufiche here, and these cards used tokens. You know, we've seen recently Shoji 2 you know, reintroducing counters to the game, the idea of putting these counters on cards that was pretty much entirely absent for the entirety of the Jasko era. But early on, they actually did this a lot. There, there were, you do a search for the word token, there's like 80 cards or something that used tokens. And the first ones, and really most of them were on non-character cards. If you can imagine just having, if you were playing enough of these, and there weren't that many that were very good there that saw that much play. But if for whatever reason you were playing a bunch of these, you'd have all these little, you know, beads on cards, keeping tra track of all your different counters on stuff. And so the watch was in that Penny Arcade box, and it, it took until late in 2006, I believe, for a promo character run before they actually put any on characters. Which you would think it'd be the opposite, because the characters make much more sense for that sort of thing. But yeah, counters were kind of just a thing that, that was just commonly printed back then. The watch, by the way, just making a pretty cool card, if, if you're sit sitting here just listening. You could form commit it to put two time tokens on it. And then you could discard a time token to stop your opponent's turn after you take damage, but then they get the watch. 
so they get to stop one of your turns. And then you can put two more time tokens on it, and then you know, start it again. Kind of a funny card. Probably never saw play, but kind of neat. An oh, interesting way to use counters. Next up we have... Okay, yeah. Alright, so next we have Cassandra and Chinese Sword Style, and this was a staple of the first year or two of the game. They never they did not tune discard properly early on they made it very there were a lot of ways to make it very easy to discard cards from your opponent's hand and obviously if you don't have cards in your hand you can't block and that equation was just never they didn't quite fully grasp that when they were making some early cards so there it was probably the most common early strategy in the game was to make your opponent discard their hand and then kill them uh you know once they got through you know, some of the loop decks and other stuff that got banned out. And there were a lot of discard-related things that got banned out too, but it, it just, it never really went away. So, in the fourth set, uh, which, by the way, was the seventh and eighth set. Eighth and ninth sets? Seventh and eighth. Because they printed two sets at a time. They actually blazed sets out. Like, every three months there'd be two sets. And they were not extra small or anything they were like 90 to 100 plus card sets so you, you can imagine the amount of play testing time that these cards did not get i'm sure the people that were testing did their best but they were turning these things out at blazing speed but anyway in the in the fourth pair of sets they started printing a bunch of really really brutal anti-discard cards this chinese sword style one of the biggest ones uh that one says, if you discard it due to their effect, they discard their hand. And if that's not what you want to do, if you don't want to discard your opponent's entire hand for the crime of them making you discard a card, you could also make them discard their entire card pool if you wanted to. You know, just in case you were about to die. <laughs> so, obviously, the, these cards, and there were five or six things like this, if I, if I recall, and, and they were designed to say, stop playing discard decks and people stopped playing discard decks because these would come out of the sideboard and their deck wouldn't work anymore and it, it actually got to the point where people played discard decks so little that people stopped sideboarding the any discard cards and then someone won nationals with a discard deck with this cassandra that was kind of a, a funny fact and just really the whole illuminated the whole silliness of this this discard versus any discard sub game but it, it kind of persisted for you know, most of the Fantasy Flight era, these anti-discard cards were kind of always around and discard decks were always like, well, you could play this if you really want to, you know, gamble on nobody packing their anti-discard. But after Cassandra won that Nationals, people pretty much always packed their Chinese sword styles or whatever they wanted to uh, in, in their sideboard just to make sure they were safe. So sideboards were really more like four cards, five cards. It was an eight card max at the time. For, for most of the game's history, so, and at least two of those cards were Chinese Sword Style or something else uh, in most cases, just in case, right? Ah, next we have clones. So, also also in this, this fourth group of sets, they introduce, and I may have this a little bit out of order, I think... What? It's gonna, what do you mean I'm not signed in? Okay, well, I blew up my thing. Anyway. Uh, so this Chinese Sword Style might have actually been the fifth set. Uh, because there, were, there was a pair of sets that did not have Soul Calibur in it. There was the SNK and Street Fighter came out as a tandem. But anyway. In, in that fourth pair of sets, they decided they were going to start doing split cards. Uh, because some other cards games did split cards, and people liked those. So we were going to do some split cards. And this was... Never a good idea. It, it did not really... There's probably an example card or two where it was kind of cool and it worked out well, but for the most part, it was stuff like this that was dramatically overpowered. Uh, if you're following along, this is a 3 difficulty attack that is a 3 speed mid for 5 and checks a 5. It is technically also a foundation that has actually not completely terrible text on it, but nothing that mattered. People played it because it was a 5 check, 3 difficulty, 5 damage attack. And so you had stuff like this that were either broken attacks or foundations that had three checks where the main thing was supposed to be the foundation. They had a token attack on it that wasn't very good. And 
the rules were a nightmare, right? It was always a mess. It never really worked, but it, it is a, a thing that existed in the game for a couple years uh, that they were trying to make work uh, that, that they did eventually have to abandon. But yeah, th those were a thing for a little while. All right, next we have Cody. Cody 3. and Cody 4. These were both promos. And mind you, these were not... I believe these were not the third and fourth Cody to show up. I think these were the first and second. Uh, they may or may not have come out come out before any inset Cody's. Something that they did for whatever reason back then was they would release promo characters that were three dots because they knew at some point they were going to put one and two dots in the sets. And they very often had two versions of a character in a set. You would have a rare version of a character and, an, and a super rare version of the character, I believe, or like a starter and one that's in the set for a lot of characters. It's kind of an interesting thing that they did. So we have Cody 3. Cody 4. These were the first stackers. So the, the stacking rules were always there, but they never really designed any characters to be stackers until these two. And they were highly competitive. Cody 3. The one you start as, the seven hand size with 24 health, with a potent discard ability on him, as, as was the case in many with many cards back then. And also a negation ability for discarding a stacked character. And then Cody Ford out was just the, the one that you stacked on top of it that gave you more benefits when you played character cards. And yeah, this was a pretty strong combo. The, the first stackers uh, had a lot of meta impact. I don't know if they fully, fully won any events, but I know they at least definitely made up some finals. But yeah, we it, we actually we did not have characters designed to be stackers until, you know, a year and a half or so into the game. Ah, now next we have Higher Caliber. Now... Higher Caliber is completely busted, but that's not why this card is here. But just to be clear, this card is completely busted. <laughs> it, it says response after your opponent plays any response. Basically ready a foundation. You technically have to pass a check against its difficulty. You ready a foundation, or an asset for that matter. And we, needless to say, this card was bananas. But the reasons here, this is actually after Higher Caliber is when we started to see the that hasn't been readied yet, this combat phase clauses. Before this, stuff that made you ready foundations just made you ready foundations, like who cares? But you know, higher caliber and, and pretty much just higher caliber, I don't recall if there were really too many other cards you know, that came along with it that really prompted this. If people just readying the same thing over and over and over again with this and with other cards was clearly way too much. And that's when we started getting those gates on, you know, just about everything. And, and we've started to see a little bit less of it just very recently, where, where some ready effects don't have that clause on them. But for a very long time, anytime you readied something, it just automatically came with that rider text on it. If you, you don't get to ready something twice under any circumstances. We're just swearing that off. It doesn't matter. You just don't do it. And, and this is where that comes from. This has been a thing since 2007, 2008 because of higher caliber. All right, next up we have Lost Cathedral Ruins. So this is one of a few cards uh, that came out in a promo pack that were really the start of this whole idea that terrains are going to have effects that hit both players. Early on, there were some terrains that were just normal assets that happened to have the terrain keyword. But in this promo pack, I, I want to say it would be late 2007 is probably where we are right now. Uh, sort of began this trend where you know, every terrain we make is going to have some weird thing that impacts both players. And there were some weird ones. You know, this one lets both players discard any number of cards in their review step, which is very strong, obviously. And, and there were other terrains like this that had really dramatic impacts on the game, and you could understand why they'd have this rule that you can only have one out. And also because of the flavor of it, right? You're, it's a soul caliber card, you're playing, this is the stage you're playing in. You play another train, you're changing your state, you know, what, what stage you're fighting in, and, and it was a whole thing, and Soul Calibur has, you know, very well rendered and, and detailed stages for all the characters, kind of a feature of the game, so they, they came up with this idea that we're just going to have all these terrain cards that have, you know, weird two-sided effects on how the game is played. And that that's kind of degenerated over time, right? Terrains these days are like forced to have some small thing that is in both players just to keep up with it but it's not they're not like this right they're not game changing impactful you know changing the rules of the game kinds of things so but th th this is where that started is these cards are the reason why terrains work that way 
All right, next, you, if, if you've talked to an old player for any amount of time, you've probably heard this one, Concealed Shallow Swipe. All right, this, this card and sort of the metagame surrounding it had a really uh, very, very, very large impact on the game. So, you know, when this card was around, the meta eventually devolved into a situation where 90% of the viable decks at an event would be really just completely selling out to landing a single Concealed Shallow Swipe for your entire life total. And there were, the, the defense was strong enough that, and the negation and the counter negation and the look at their hand and, and pick cards out of it stuff was strong enough that this was a real strategy. And you didn't even, they only ran a few other attacks to serve as glorified action cards to go, you know, shut down their hand or shut down, you know, half of their staging area or something like that. And it was all about just shoving a shallow swipe through. Uh, there was a lot of giant speed boosts with not a lot of speed reduction at the time, and we'll get to that some more later. So, you know, that this was the strat, and... You know, up until this point, and you still had cards like Higher Caliber around amongst this, you know, the devs had the, the design and dev team at, I think it was Fantasy Flight by now, kind of, kind of head in the sand at it, right? You know, people complain about Higher Caliber, they would just say like, oh, just don't play responses with a straight face. And, and it really wasn't until this event where they had to actually go watch all this stuff play out in person that they realized they kind of had a problem in their hands. And really, after this forward, you know, there was a lot, there's always been a lot of caution, a lot of energy around, you try to make sure this can never happen again, right? Try to make sure we never have it be possible to build a deck where you're just running six or seven attacks and, and just sitting there walling up for an eternity, going for your one hit KO. And there, there's like not even a reason to poke. It's so reliable. You don't need a backup plan. And, you know, that we, we might be a couple slides off of like where that really materializes. But after this, you saw a lot of, you know, this card, obviously, and a lot of other cards that were feeding into this picture get banned. Concealed Shell Swipe actually did not win that tournament, <laughs> by the way. It was actually a mill deck running, you know, all the same defensive pieces, but just winning without having to land an attack by, by doing some mill game plant stuff. But... Yeah, re really a, a very, very big impact and and drove a lot of stuff uh, going forward. Okay, yeah. All right. And so there's not a whole lot. So there were certainly plenty of sets after Concealed Shallow Swipe under Fantasy Flight. And they started to get a little bit better. They were, you know, trying to, you know, dodge this, you know, one tech thing. Maybe don't print anything quite as silly as Higher Caliber. They still made some mistakes. There was... Still, you know, meta still had like loop decks and lockdown and you know hard lock decks and things like that that kept cropping up. They decided to make we're going to make a competitive Chun Li at some point, and that was a disaster. But you know, overall, that they, they they kind of went through that holding pattern. They eventually brought in James Hada, who was a multiple time champion in the game, to come sort of be their new lead of design. And you know, after sort of dealing with a, a set that was kind of already built when he came in, with these 2009 sets, the first pair of sets in 2009, the Soul Calibur set and the first Shadow War set, uh, which we talked about Blue Chen. I've just got Soul Calibur cards here. Really just, we're just going to completely change the design paradigm. We're just going to completely change how we think about our tuning cards and largely to stop things like the Concealed Shallow Swipe stuff from happening again. So stop things like the, the six attack, I'm going to hard lock you decks. The uh, three, four attack. I'm just going to loop this thing forever. Decks and Shell Swipe was the peak of that, but there were, you know, like I talked about the loop decks earlier. This was just a constant thing that just kept happening. And this was, you know, supposed to be a fighting card game, right? It's supposed to be about attacking and blocking and back and forth and stuff. And and James's solution to this, in large part, was to make foundations very, very, very bad at blocking. So if you, if you take a look at the top right corner of the cards in this spread, you'll notice that only three of them even have blocks. And that was about the proportion in these two sets. The, the very large majority of the foundations did not have blocks. And the ones that did block pretty much never blocked much better than plus three. Now, it, 
the the next couple sets kind of backed off of this a little bit, but the the fundamental pretty much was the same idea that we're going to make people run real attack counts because they will not be able to block if they don't. <laughs> and you know, pretty early on into these 2000, I think after the the fourth of these 2009 sets came out, they just rotated out all the old stuff and said, "This is the format now. We're just going to be playing a completely different game." And you know, it really a, a huge sea change that probably saved the game. You know, even though, you know, it probably went too, more farther than it needed to, right? We, we obviously are happy to have all foundations have blocks now. And we just, you know, try not to print, you know, attacks that can kill win games on their own or things like that. But you know, it was a really, really, really big deal and a huge change. And I believe, funnily enough, the... The worlds, the first worlds of that format was still won by a very low attack count deck uh, because, you know, you may not have been able to block with nothing found it, but foundations, but you sure had a lot of damage reduction available. So <laughs> there was there were some decks that were just doing that. And there was a character named Hilde and yeah, they, they still <laughs> didn't quite get away from those low attack count decks immediately. And also, you know, that's what people were used to playing competitively, right? That's what they're, they're always Right, no matter what the meta was for the last, you know, three or four years, it was how do I build a deck that wins with four, eight attacks or something like that? So they pretty much always check fives. But you know, after the the, the couple of offenders were hit, uh, things did sort of play out as desired. Right, decks started having to run, you know, 25, 30, 35 percent attacks to be able to operate. So really, probably the biggest change in the game's history was, was this sort of total revolution in, in how they wanted to like make sure decks were being built and played and with this uh we're, we're gonna have a bunch of firsts now so dragon lifter this is, these are the sets that introduced the combo keyword we did not have combo before these first 2009 sets from from james hada and you know it, it makes sense, right? You introduce this keyword that gives you some powerful effects, but it requires you to be playing multiple attacks, right? That's what they wanted people to be doing, right? Run run real attack counts in your deck. And Dragonlifter was yeah, probably the most pernicious of these. Uh, it was a four difficulty two check. If you comboed it with a kick, you got to basically have a six high eight stun two, which, you know, for its time was really good. People almost never played six hand size competitively. So this was almost half of your opponent's life total on its own. And so dragon lifter decks were were everywhere for a pretty good while and yeah one of the the first combos there were many many combos in these two sets and next we'll look at memories of a nightmare and this is these two sets also were the first time we had something resembling seal so at the time the way they did this was that they would say for the rest of this turn that foundation has a blank text box and, and seal is a bit of an alteration for that from for some technical reasons but yeah, these two sets introduce this idea that you're just going to pick one of your opponent's foundations and say, like, no, that thing doesn't have text. And, and there was a character that was themed around this. And yeah, not too much to say, just kind of the, the first time we saw that ability. And this is this card is uh, eerily similar to Irrefutable Force of Nature, where you pick one of the three symbols. Uh, probably some heavy inspiration there. Uh, no Forgiveness, another Siegfried card in this case. This is the first time we saw flipping foundations you know again makes sense if you're worried about people building these giant walls of defensive foundations what if we just start turning some of them upside down and just making them blank cards uh, this card was never particularly good or particularly played i i don't remember i didn't really look very hard for a well, flip card that did see play this is one of the first ones though this idea that we're going to make these face down blank foundations and that's going to be a mechanic in the game now. That that did not start until these 2009 sets. Uh, and every Wrath of Heaven, this is this is a bit different. This is another one of those combos. It's a double combo. And this card is the reason Staff Strike exists. And it's kind of a funny story. So it, this is a, it's an 8 difficulty double combo. Alright, so I'll repeat. It is an 8 difficulty double combo. That people unironically play that a 10. <laughs> <laughs> they would do this and it was not highly competitive but it was very strong when it worked and it was funny and people liked it and it was cool and it was really one of the 
you know, first times that sort of a not really competitive card was still, you know, a very desirable ultra rare that people like to play in Mayweather. Not that there weren't, there were endless meme cards before that, right? Characters with all sorts of funky abilities, but, you know, really th this idea of like, hey, we can put a card in our set that's not the most competitive, but people are really, really going to like it and it's going to be in the ultra rare slot and it's going to, it's going to sell packs and it's going to drive trade value. Uh, really, Wrath of Heaven uh, became a model for some future cards, and one of those was Trinity Geyser, and then, you know, later on down the road, Staff Strikes in, the, in that same shape, where it, it's kind of borderline competitive, it has seemed some, some, some competitive success, but, you know, the real idea of a card is it's a card, it's an exciting card people really like to play, the power level's not quite there, but it's almost there, it's really impressive sometimes, right? Yeah, so, so Wrath of Heaven, uh, the first of a lineage of cards in this shape. A few sets into this 2009, uh, we got this card Playful Slice. And this was really... So, uh, I've gotten away from reading some of these cards, but uh, this is a 4 difficulty 2 check. While it's in your card pool, your attacks get minus 2 difficulty. So it not only doesn't count as progressive, it gives you one less off of that, right? Imagine if Somebody double activates Twisting Azure Inferno, and you, you get the idea, right? So, this was really, before this, you know, there, there were, com you know, decks that won with combos and whatnot, but never really, like, a huge attack quantity decks were, were never really a viable thing until Playful Slice came out, and, you know, primarily Kevin Broberg came up with this deck that had Playful Slice in tandem with a lot of cheap attacks and some overpowered card draw that was around at the time. And just, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna play one or two Playful Slices, we're gonna re take things out of progressive, we're gonna play six, seven, eight attacks, and they're all gonna be for four, five, or six, and you're gonna die. And th this was really the, the first time that was shown to be a, like, a real strategy that you could actually do in this game that would work. So you can understand why they were sort of willing to push the envelope on a card like this but it, it's really the place where that envelope got pushed a little too far and somewhat related you know these playful slice decks were usually with a seven hand size that had a damage bonus on it and, and for a very long time the idea of a seven hand size that gave more than one damage to things was just completely taboo right it, you just you will not find very many, or at least not without some restrictions at the very least, seven hand size characters that put plus two damage or more on everything. And so that's why you see some really old players that are a little higher on like present Mike 2 than, than some of the newer players are. And, you know, uh, now we have you know, Dobby 2 dot just sort of completely breaking that, that mold in half. Uh, not that some, you know, Bebop era characters didn't do that also. But yeah, for a very long time, there was a there was a lot of uh, controls put on how powerful seven hand size would be, really because of the playful slice decks. All right, and then we're, we're gonna move on. So at the end of two thousand nine, uh, Fantasy Flight decided they were done trying to do this collectible card game thing. They dropped the game. Uh, Jason Horonsky stepped in and you know made a deal to pick it up from them and. Jasko's first set was this Red Horizon IP, their own original IP. And, you know, similar to when James Hada came in, you know, Jason came in and when we had a bunch of firsts. So this Miska character is really the, the first time that we had the ally keyword be really used as a theme. The ally keyword trait. And really, but like notably before this, it was pretty much just punch, kick, ranged maybe some throw decks and those and weapon of course and th those were the keywords and that was there were some other keyword traits there were some taunts there were some allies or whatever but everything that was ever like referenced on a card was pretty much looking for a punch or kick with like a couple odd exceptions you know, a punch kick weapon one of those one of those sort of core four or five keywords and you know red horizon started expanding that a little bit by adding some ally theme stuff and that would continue to expand over time uh, especially as they added more keyword traits. And we have a Miska card here, Concussion Blast. This was the first Flash card. This was uh, that I could find. The first card that had the text just skip this attack's enhanced that Flash obviously wasn't a keyword yet. 
they would eventually decide that they liked this enough to keyword it and start trying to make sure there were a couple of these per set. Yeah, and Concussion Blast was a, a relevant card at that time. It is a two check, but it's a four high eight flash, and if it's blocked, it clears from the card pool. V very nice functional card. You know, eventually got power creeped out a little bit, but yeah, this is Red Horizon was where we saw the first flash effects. And then in the second Red Horizon set, we have perfect accuracy here. This is a another pseudo seal card, but that's not really what I want to get at here. This was uh, this Tides of Vengeance set was really the first time we saw Flip used as a cost. You know, before this, we had had some foundations being turned face down as part of effects and stuff. But Tides is really the, the first set where we started to see like, OK, well, to take this even further to stop these like you know, forever staging areas, endless, you know, reusable defensive pieces, just, you know, getting slammed over and over and over again and being an unbeatable wall. We're, we're going to start making some of these abilities flip costs. So you get them essentially once per game. And Perfect Accuracy was one of those. There were, you know, plenty more in the Tides of Vengeance set. And yeah, the, this is where flip costs began. And it was it was very, very wordy at first. They, they did not uh, make flip into a terminology. So it says, he turned this foundation face down colon, do the effect, and then it has to specify this card is considered a foundation with a blank text box. Uh, they, they Before too long, they, they just started saying flip and just made it a rule, right? Because they, they, they kept making these cards and it was always taking up a ton of space. Uh, and also in Tides events, we have Divine Tribulation and Kaplow. So these were both very, very meta-defining cards, and uh, my my highlight for these is that it's really the first time the desperation keywords as a, a difficulty reduction mechanism became kind of a problem. So desperation been around the whole time. There were always cards with. Uh, so if you don't know, desperation was a keyword that said if you're health, if you're at less than half health, this attack's difficulty is now this number. And the Desperation cards before this, you know, they might get one less difficulty or something or just weren't that powerful or whatever. And, and in Tides of Vengeance, they, with these two cards, they really sort of pushed that envelope and made a six difficulty, uh, effectively five high seven with multiple, and an eight difficulty five high ten reversal with stun two into a three difficulty and a five difficulty respectively. And, and that metagame... That, that, they, I don't think either of these cards ever... Kapow might have at some point gotten some sort of a ban or similar equivalent, but th that metagame pretty much taught us the lesson that, yes, you, you can take Desperation too far because you you end up with games where... And, and it, it, it's not a very good play experience to be like, well, if I attack my opponent, their giant bomb attacks are going to have minus three difficulty and I'm going to lose for it, right? And, and we've always had some of that with reversals and stuff too, but... It was just a very, very extreme you know, punishment for trying to make progress towards winning the game. And, and people didn't really, you know, wasn't a dynamic that people ever particularly liked. Uh, so this was sort of the first, the first ring of the bell that would eventually lead to, the, you know, Desperation just not being included in MHA at all. And it, 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 it got a couple swings back uh, before that, but this was really the first time it's like, wow, okay. Just as the raw difficulty, that this desperation mechanic can be a problem, and when it when it did reappear later uh, in fourth Bridge and Scorpion, it wasn't really the difficulties that were powering the problem. It was just the power level of the the desperation blocked abilities. One moment for water. We'll look at Vespera. So Vespera wasn't really the first of anything, per se. Um, there weren't too many reversal themed decks that were very good before her that were a couple but this was a starter character and uh she was a, a big 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 problem so she has three enhances that give attacks minus speed depending on their zone basically and she could lose two health after she blocks to go pick up a reversal from her discard pile obviously then reversal with it and, and so on and so forth and this was a, at the very minimum, it was a local store stomper. It was, you know, miserable to play against. You you couldn't attack into it at all without, it, like, every time you attacked it, you felt like you came out worse for for your, your efforts of trying. And, and pretty much if you couldn't, you know, commit her or shut her off or go after her discard pile or something, 
or at some point just playing an overwhelming number of attacks so that reversals didn't matter or whatever. It, it was just very bad, especially for new players, but even in general, right? People kind of hated playing against Vespera. And, you know, th this, it was very damaging to the game's uh, efforts to, to grow from being, you know, left for dead and then picked up by a small company. And, you know, now when you do get stores on board, they're getting, players are getting fed up with having to deal with Vespera all the time. It, and, you know, so this was, you know, not only sort of a, a first shot across the bow of like, okay, it is possible for reversal to be a problem, right? Which it was never really that much of a thing before that, uh, it, aside from a couple like weird edge cases, right? But also, you know, a lot of, you know, upcoming sets and, you know, power levels and whatnot, and the way, you know, there were, this is the reason we ended up with the safe keyword. I think we'll end up with the first safe attack somewhere on here. I'm thinking I forgot a card from these slides, by the way. I'm going to have to go. I'll find a way to, like, custom bring it up here. But <laughs> the, yeah, it, just, just Vespera's impact led to a lot of reactions, a lot of reactionary design and, and, and follow-up and, and the way things were done for the next few years. A lot of stuff was centered around you know, we need to make sure Vespera is beatable because they didn't want to ban a starter deck character, right? Okay, so we have Martial Arts Champion up here. I'll, I'll hit that in a minute. Oh, we're skipping a slide ahead. There's our first save card. But I'm just, I'm just going to go into UVS Ultra. And I can't believe this is, kind of, this is like the card that kind of gave me the idea to even make a list like this. Let's talk about a girl like any other. So this was the first Red Horizon set card. And it's a 1-5 foundation that says Enhanced Commit. This attack gets minus 3 speed. Minimum 0, you couldn't make an attack less than 0 speed with this, but nonetheless. Before this set, before Red Horizon, the idea of foundations reducing speed was relatively foreign. It, there, was, there were one or two foundations that did printed speed resets. I think there was one actually gave an attack minus speed but it just wasn't a thing and you know nowadays it's it's almost like a staple you're just expected to have these foundations in your deck almost in a lot of cases and it, it was not always like that uh before the red horizon set came out it, it was just you know that if you made speed go up it was not going down <laughs> for the most part so you know, it really, really turned out to be a big change. Uh, the introduction of Girl Like Any Other, other cards like it that reduce speed. We saw more reset to print in speed. And then on the back of that, because now everyone's playing foundations that reduce speed, the speed numbers on our attacks have to get higher and there's more speed boosting. And, the, and the, it, it's always been a bit of an arms race of, you know, how is the speed reduction available, balanced around the speed boosting available, and if one's a little too strong, then the other gets stronger, and sometimes that's too strong, and then, you know, decks that aren't running speed boost or aren't running speed reduction, you know, end up in trouble, and we're seeing some of that now with this MHA format, right? You know, you, you can decide which came first, but let, let, for argument's sake, you know, you have Momo and Eraserhead shaving to speed off of everything, and so now you need to give decks access to more speed boost to catch up. And so now we have one with nature, we have snack time, and now maybe that's too much. And, and decks that aren't really in this speed race have a hard time competing. Uh, and we, we very much had some of that early on, you know, in, in these Red Horizon formats as well. All right, back to our actual slideshow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you'll notice that Martial Arts Champion is an older card. They, they actually reprinted a handful of old cards in, in these early Red Horizon days, and uh, not long after this, Martial Arts Champion became a problem. So, or enough of a problem. So there were, it, it, this is a foundation that says response commit after your opponent plays an ability that will draw cards or add cards to their hand, cancel it. And what you might notice is that there's no non-character clause on there. This card is allowed to hit characters, and there were some decks at the time that were otherwise very good that if Martial Arts Champions showed up, they stopped operating, right? Because their character became blank. They couldn't play their character's main ability because it would just get can it turned into stun one. And this was eventually enough of a problem that they errated this card to say non-character, and going forward after this, 
for the most part with a couple of exceptions. Whenever they printed something like this, you would get this non-character clause on it, and that's arguably even gone too far, right? There are some things that are like barely a little slap on the wrist that have a non-character clause on it that maybe don't need it. Or and but you know, sometimes they've forgotten it and it has kind of been a problem where some characters haven't been viable because like oh XYZ just cancels them, right? And so it's been an ongoing thing, but this is really what started the trend of like whenever there's an ability that cancels something or responds to an ability being played that does XYZ, uh, there's very often a non-character clause attached to it, and that's because of Martial Arts Champion. All right, next we have Power Wave. Uh, this was the first safe attack, and safe is a keyword that's not in MHA because a reversal is not in MHA, and safe just says your opponent can't reversal this. And this is one of those reactions to Vespera. Uh, they started showing up in the King of Fighters block, which were the sets after that Tides of Vengeance set. And it would eventually be keyworded because, you know, Vespera kept being competitive even as they started banning some of her pieces and whatnot. And people continued to be fed up with that. So they, they kept, you know, they printed a few of these can't play an attack as a reversal cards and then eventually started keywording it and putting it in more and more so that people could you know, if they really wanted to, they could craft an attack lineup that was mostly safe so that they could play into Vespera. Uh, next up, we have Maxima. So, uh, this guy was definitely banned. Uh, he, he's going to look very similar to Kirishima 1. Uh, <laughs> to, to old players, not really much surprise also had to be touched. But this was, the power level aside, this was sort of the first time that Maxima and his teammates Kadash and Kula where the first time that sort of picking up foundations was used as a theme. And this is sort of piggybacking off of, you know, we've added these flip costs and now what else can we do? Now we're turning all these foundations face down and we're we're building face down foundations from our deck and stuff. Well, what if we start picking up foundations as a quote unquote cost? Uh, and, you know, we're, we're all familiar with how that actually plays out and how, how much, you know, it is very often equally as much of a benefit as it is a cost, if not more of a benefit. And these characters were not... At least Maxim and Kadash were definitely tuned as if the pickup was more of a cost than it actually was, and they were both you know, problems to varying degrees. Uh, Kula was a little more restricted, uh, but she, she sort of did a little bit less. She, she picked up a foundation to cancel and enhance, which was very good, but that's kind of all she did. Uh, because, you know, negation... It, you know, from the old days, right, we knew that negating was very strong, right? So Kula was kept a little bit more in check, but uh, this is the first time that picking up foundations uh, was really a thing in, in a set of cards. Uh, also from that, that same Ruler of Time set, the second King of Fighters set, is Mature. And I want to say this might not be precisely true, but so Mature has an ability that lets you lose two health to make all your checks to play mid attacks get plus two for the turn. And people leveraged this to make decks that were actually 59 attacks. 59 attacks and one copy of Mature. And we're always going to, all the attacks are mid, so we're always going to check fives and we're just going to play strings of pretty much three difficulty attacks. And we're always going to have a six attack hand because we can't not have a six attack hand. And at some point you're going to fall over to this. Right? It might not be on turn two, but you, you you cannot deal with six attacks being thrown at every single turn at you for very long, right? And obviously that deck was a problem. It got banned. There were some you know, similar vibe kind of mature inspired decks that ran like 40 attacks or it, just a little bit more than half attacks that followed up to a little not too long after the Tomahawk Man decks and Zoe decks. And... You know, this led to, I believe at one point there were a couple sets where they didn't print any three difficulty attacks at all. Uh, there, there was a lot of concern about how dangerous three difficulty attacks could be if you made too many of them or if they did too much check boosting or whatnot. And, and there's still, you know, probably even going on now just looking at some of the MHA sets, there's a lot of fear around three difficulty critical mass as a possible thing that could be a problem at some point. Notably, though, it requires a character that's that's doing this much to help you pass all your checks, right? But, you know, the, those characters exist sometimes, and if you get the right mix of, you know, a character that's just good enough at it and, and enough three difficulty attacks that are good enough to, to do their thing, then it can be a problem. So it's it's, it's been something that uh, Jessica's been very wary of ever since. 
Ah, next we have Nivose. <laughs> and this... This card is a, a very, very slow attack that gets plus one damage each time your opponent passes an enhance. And... This is it maybe not technically a straight line from Nivose to Deadlock existing, but very close to a straight line from Nivose to Deadlock existing. So there were there were a f mainly Garrett Brett, but also a few other players that would play these decks that were built to you know play defense, build a huge staging area like 20, 30 foundations, and that could kill you with other stuff. They had other attacks in their decks. They were not four attack decks or anything, but Nivose was you know, sort of the MVP, and these decks would be built to where they would have a lot of free enhances, or, you know, all their foundations would have some enhance that they could play, and at some point I have 30 foundations that all have one or two enhances on them, and you have, you know, 15, 20 foundations, and some of them don't, some of them are face down, some of them don't have enhances, whatever. I'm going to play all my enhances. My Devosa is going to come for 20, and a lot of those enhances are going to increase its speed so you can't actually block this. And those decks were very effective and played very, very long games and led to some very, very long top cuts and some very, very frustrated uh, Jasco staff members who had to who had to stand by and watch these games, right? And so you not too many sets after, you know, actually quite a few, you know, a fair few sets after this, but the, these Novose decks took a little while to really show up and come to fruition, I want to say. Uh, I don't think they were quite things immediately out of the box, but there were a couple years where these super defensive air decks were kind of at the top of the meta and just playing these really super long games. And eventually, uh, Jasko got sufficiently fed up with this that they started printing deadlock things. But before that, uh, we had the, the Mega Man and Darkstalker sets. And, and the card I have here is Yellow Scarf. And this isn't really about Yellow Scarf, but I want to make the point so this, this card has an ability that says E destroy. You can use any ranged attack to try to block this attack if it had a plus zero mid block. And that is a callback to a change that happened with this set. It used to be that every ranged card would have this text. It could block another ranged attack specifically as if it had a plus zero mid block. And it was supposed to represent two Hadoukens shooting at each other, right? If you're in a fighting game, you shoot two ranged attacks at each other, normally cancel each other out. So it's a flavor thing. Range attacks would always have this clause on them where they could block other range attacks really easily. And at some point they even keyworded this, right? Where they didn't even put that text on the cards anymore. It was just the keyword ability of ranged. Well, insert Mega Man set. 90% of the attacks in Mega Man are ranged, right? Flavor-wise. That's just how that IP works. And this just wasn't a teenable situation anymore. So they did away with ranged being a keyword like that uh, at this time. But up until then, it, ranged always has this, this funky functionality on it. Uh, also, the Mega Man set, we, uh, this is top spin is shown here. This is one of the first slam cards. So in Mega Man, uh, pretty much the way you take damage is either something is shot at you or somebody runs into you. And your know, bosses had like one or two actual moves. And we, you know, need a, a way to represent them just kind of running into you. Because some of the boss fights were designed of like that was the, the threat was the boss was just going to run into you. And also, you know, shoulder tackles, you know, maybe some elbow smash, some you know, headbutts, things like that, that didn't really, weren't really punches or kicks or anything and kind of needed a keyword. So they came up with the slam keyword trait to represent those sorts of things. And it's not always been used like that, but that that's sort of the idea behind it. And now, you know, a few sets later, uh, with the World of Indians release, which is a level 99 IP, that is uh, from Battlecon, if you've seen those board games. But uh, this Armor Expert card has the text players with more than 10 foundations at a foundation at the top of their deck. And this was the start of Deadlock. They, it was not a keyword for this set. It was a keyword not very long after, though. And Indian sort of saw the first experimental cards that were meant to stop these. You know, Nivose and other, you know, really late game. We're just going to play until we both have 20 plus foundations and... You know, our top cuts matches are all going to take hours kinds of decks. Uh, shortly after the Indians release, uh, there was the, the Red Horizon Blood Omen set. And they introduced a bunch of keyword traits with this set. They decided that, you know, punch, kick, 
ranged weapon at slam wasn't enough and so they added a bunch more keyword traits we got charge in the set we got fury in the set and we got tech in the set uh, three new keyword traits that you know, to throw into the mix of you know things now you know we see now in mha right there's stuff that based around charge attacks stuff that based around fury attacks stuff based around tech attacks and their their level of definition varies uh charge i think was originally supposed to be so that they could do something with any of those Street Fighter moves where the input is to hold a button and then press the other button it is like a charge attack in Street Fighter, and so they wanted that to be a keyword that they could put on things. Uh, kind of nowadays gets used for general like electricity stuff or somebody's charging at somebody or something with energies going on. Uh, Fury's never been well defined. It's kind of just someone's angry, <laughs> so they make it a Fury move. Uh, tech is obviously something technological. Uh, and, and really, it's also sort of where we started to get this keyword soup stuff, right? Where, like, okay, this is range, but it's also tech, but we could also call it a web, and we're just going to put them all on here. Because we have so many traits and so many different trait decks that, you know, we, we want to give cards multiple traits so that they feel more useful, so that they don't just only go in one kind of deck and things like that. Uh, so this is where, like, the keyword count per card really spiked up, starting with this set. Also in this set, there's Pulse Player. This is a, one of the first EX cards. EX was actually not a keyword until relatively late into the end's lifetime, really until 2016, uh, before EX showed up. And that, that sounds funny because it seems so obvious, right? Why not just have a speed version of Powerful? But it wasn't until Blood Omen that EX showed up. Uh, Pulse Player, one of the, the cooler entries where the EX ability was used quite a bit. Uh, and then a few sets later, uh, we have Spike here. Uh, this is nothing specific about Spike himself, but you know, after Blood Omen and uh, the resulting Street Fighter set and, and sort of the power levels were quite a bit lower uh, than, than they had been at various points. And a lot of people liked that, but also, you know, Jessica kind of decided this was a bit of a problem that cars were so low powered because you you had situations where they, they felt like. You know, first of all, the characters themselves didn't feel strong enough, and second of all, it, it felt like it, it was hard to get players into the game because if you just sort of picked up a pile of cards, you probably couldn't kill anybody with it. If you just sort of built your own deck, it was it was really hard for a lot of new players to build decks that could kill people because the you know kill conditions relied on very specific things, right? You you had to have X Y Z multiple tech. You had to be running one of the you know the ten best attacks in the format or whatever have this very specific strategy, and so any given you know, someone just picking up their favorite Street Fighter character and building a deck wasn't actually killing anybody with it ever. It, it was a bit of a problem for Barrier to enter the game, so with the, the Cowboy Bebop set for the ensuing couple of years, they started really ramping power levels up, in part to try to get at this problem. And obviously, you know, power creep has its own issues, right? But, you know, as you can see, Spike here is not really pushed, even by today's standards. He has a 7 health, 7 hand size, 24 health character, that can flip foundations for plus or minus two speed and puts plus or minus one damage on everything as long as you have more face sounds than your opponent. Uh, kind of a familiar model to a seven hand size we know from these days, uh, but with kind of kind of a mix of Eraser Head and Tokoyami here, right? <laughs> if that sounds scary, uh, you're right. Right? I was, he was very good for pretty much the entire time he was in the format. He was only the top deck kind of briefly because they continued to creep power up and there were there were decks doing more powerful things with synergies and spike was just kind of a generic good stuff guy but always always very good obviously but yeah it was sort of the the harbinger of the bebop era as we call it uh, also with this set i think this is gonna be one of our last cards here i don't think we have too many left uh it's probably just gonna be a couple first so jet is here he discards cards from the top of his deck for plus two damage and this was really a new idea in Cowboy Bebop. So the, this whole idea of self-mill being a theme, uh, and particularly a fire theme, was a brand new concept as of just a few years ago when Cowboy Bebop came out. Before that, it wasn't really a thing or a strategy in the game where you had a symbol that did a lot of stuff with milling cards in the discard pile. That was, it was a brand new idea relatively recent. Uh, and Jet and Matt Perot from the Bebop set were sort of the, the big starters of this. Uh... The next set in Mortal Kombat, we got a four-hander named Goro, and um, so he's a four-hand size. He gets to go uh, search his discard pile for what four cards he wants to have each turn, basically. And he has 40 health, and he put a lot of damage on things, and 
Uh, it was kind of obvious from the outset that he would eventually be banned. He was eventually be banned. They, they also made, you know, because Mortal Kombat theming, they made Shiva another forehand size 40 health character. That wasn't as problematic, but had some synergies. And these two kind of uh, rung the death bell of forehanders. After, after these two and, and the problems that they caused, Jasko decided they're, they're just not going to do forehanders anymore. Because trying to make a forehand size character that's strong enough to like really be viable, it by definition means you're you're making some really really high roll abilities at a bare minimum, if not just overly overpowered abilities, just to, to make them feel plausible. And it, it it's too much trouble for what it's worth. Uh, so that's why fourth kind is not a forehander, for instance. Uh, but th these two are really the the last forehand size that they printed. And I think this might be lastly going forth to the the seventh cross set. Uh, so first of all, we have this gauge keyword that it's really only existed for a couple sets because they're not we're not using an MHA obviously, but it it helps you do character stacking effects. If you land a gauge move for its gauge rating and damage, then you get to go search your deck and discard pile for any character and build it. And also on Ashen Claws, this is the first time freeze showed up as a as a as a term uh, before. 2019, uh, if, if we wanted to do anything that froze stuff, it would just be spelled out, right? That card doesn't ready during the next ready step. It wasn't until 7th Cross that they decided to make that a term, and they haven't done a ton with it. There's been like one freeze-themed character. It's kind of been on a few cards here and there, but yeah, it wasn't really a term until this set. Anyway, that is all. So uh, this seems like it's probably gone on for a solid hour. So thanks to anyone that actually sat there and listened through this whole thing. Uh... I guess let me know in the comments if this was interesting to you. I have no idea how much entertainment value there is in this. It just kind of started as an idea of something that would not take as long, and it turned into something that was like, whatever, we'll just do a full full little history tour. I'm sure I missed some cards, but, you know, any any fellow boomers can check and point out whatever they want. Uh, should be some fun conversations in there. But yeah, I won't keep you any longer. Thanks for seeing through this whole thing, and uh, I hope it was interesting on some level. All right, have a good night.